I usually find the realist genre in painting to be totally boring, lifeless, and lacking any artistic spirit whatsoever. But the work of Laszlo Medniansky feels different. Probably because it's so emotive and aesthetically gruesome, showing the grittiness of life, the rough and the ugly, but in a more emphatically grotesque and archetypally horrific way, using many artistic and cultural elements and devices to get this across, and adding some sense of drama which allows the imagination to flutter. By using abstract impressionist and symbolist techniques, his work looks very similar to Goya, and the art has a sense of unconscious terror at its pure state, which indeed is getting at a real ideal, a real sense of the fall from grace. This isn't the same as uplifting and glorifying the mundane for its own sake, which is often boring and ideologically motivated. Most realist artists simply portray day-to-day -day aspects very exactly, as if they can be exalted in a beautiful canvas without any aesthetic insertion whatsoever, which comes undoubtedly from high culture. To me, a lot of his art represents the underside of nature. That dreary stage in the cycle of scarcity, starvation, things eating themselves out of a lack. Everything that's coming through in his paintings is death, poverty, the starvation of people and of nature, either spiritually and or literally. Because of this, it feels very ghostly, too. It's immediately meaningful and deeply understood because it connects at the root with our sense of what happens when nature isn't lush and full, when things aren't working as they should be. There's a drought, a lack of life. Influenced in this artist's case by social, economic, and spiritual conditions. An example of an artist who shows the complete opposite side of nature would be Rubens, in a very archetypal way. However, Medniansky's landscapes can sometimes show a more natural, lush part of nature, with the full variance of the seasons, but he seems to have a particular fondness for amber glows as well as the fogginess from Impressionism, and a perpetual autumn feeling, still matching the spiritual condition. At the end of this video, I'm going to read a poem which I think captures this archetypal sense perfectly. Baron Laszlo Medniansky was a Hungarian aristocrat, painter, philosopher, traveler, and war correspondent in World War I, and one of the most enigmatic figures in the history of Hungarian art. He spent most of his life moving around Europe working as an artist, with considerable periods in seclusion, but mingled with people across society, in the aristocracy, art world, peasantry, and army, many of whom became the subjects of his paintings. His most important works depict scenes of landscapes and peasants, working people, particularly from his home region in the Kingdom of Hungary. He painted many pictures of the Carpathian Mountains and the Hungarian Plains, as well as portraits of his friends and family, and images of soldiers during the First World War. Another significant group of pictures, after his landscapes, were his outlaw pictures, forerunners to his soldier pictures. While studying in Paris, he was exposed to Impressionism, which deeply influenced him. Yet the time period he worked in and his style makes him a post-Impressionist, with influences from symbolism and Art Nouveau. You can see how successfully he uses the Impressionist style as a tool to actually bring to life the truer feelings and the sense of a nature scene, which is the actual goal of art. The way he constructed his nature scenes is incredible. It feels like they're glittering or glowing, towing the line perfectly between the real and the unreal. The scenes he portrays show the difficult historical and social landscape of the places he painted, particularly in his home country. 1880 to 1910 was the period of the fastest industrialization in Hungary, especially in Bohemia. The factories exploded, and a huge number of people, usually ethnic Czechs who had been dissatisfied in the countryside, moved to the cities and became workers in the new factories. The economic development mainly affected the Habsburg supporters, the Austrian businessmen who bought up the bankrupted peasants and nobility's lands. In the big towns there were great developments, but the countryside was left behind and was a complete disaster. The majority of the population was living in rural areas and working as peasants. 
The new economy forced most of the peasants, as well as small and medium nobility, to lose all they had. This was what actually broke Hungary, and 1.5 million Hungarians emigrated to America. Mainly because of the poverty and overpopulation in the countryside, Hungary's population was augmented by 2 million in the 1880s, and the increased numbers of workers meant lower wages and less work. The overpopulation also exerted greater demands on the already limited amount of available farmland. Landless agricultural workers worked from sunrise till sundown for usually less than 25 cents a day. Industry was barely developed in Hungary, and the poverty-stricken peasant could not find work in a nearby city or town. Many of the peasant laborers had their fill of the back-breaking work and starvation pay. They gambled everything on a trip to America because they had little to lose and everything to gain. During this time, a semi-feudal land ownership system determined that one half of all arable land belonged to landowners with large and medium-sized estates. The other half was given to small landholders, dwarf landholding farmers, and landless agricultural peasants. The small landholders owned from 15 to 70 acres and were able to make a living from their own property, but the dwarf landholding farmers owned a house and maybe a few acres, but could barely subsist on their own land. This latter group, along with the landless agricultural workers, were the ones who immigrated to America. Now I'm going to read this poem from Lord Byron, which I feel shows the completeness of this archetypal pure idea in poetry the lack of vitality, of life, of energy, of supply and nutrients, of that very visceral, substantive impetus of the world and of the universe, death consuming all and taking over in a totalizing way, demonstrating the unison of the physical and the spiritual. Essentially, it's as simple as turned on versus turned off. Everything feels turned off, withering away, disappearing, like it had never existed. I had a dream, which was not all a dream. The bright sun was extinguished, and the stars did wander darkling in the eternal space. Rayless and pathless, and the icy earth, swung blind and blackening in the moonless air. Morn came and went, and came and brought no day, and men forgot their passions in the dread. Of this their desolation, and all hearts were chilled into a selfish prayer for light. And they did live by watchfires, and the thrones, the palaces of crowned kings, the huts, the habitations of all things which dwell, were burnt for beacons. Cities were consumed, and men were gathered round their blazing homes to look once more into each other's face. Happy were those who dwelt within the eye of the volcanoes and their mountain torch. A fearful hope was all the world contained. Forests were set on fire, but hour by hour they fell and faded, and the crackling trunks extinguished with a crash, and all was black. The brows of men by the despairing light wore an unearthly aspect, as by fits the flashes fell upon them, some lay down and hid their eyes and wept, and some did rest their chins upon their clenched hands and smiled and others hurried to and fro and fed their funeral piles with fuel and looked up with mad disquietude on the dull sky, the pall of a past world, and then again with curses cast them down upon the dust and gnashed their teeth and howled. The wild birds shrieked and terrified did flutter on the ground and flap their useless wings. The wildest brutes came tame and tremulous and vipers crawled and twined themselves among the multitude. Hissing but stingless, they were slain for food. And war, which for a moment was no more, did glut himself again. A meal was bought with blood, and each sate sullenly apart, gorging himself in gloom. No love was left. All earth was but one thought, and that was death. Immediate and inglorious, and the pang of famine fed upon all entrails, Men died, and their bones were tombless as their flesh. The meager by the meager were devoured. Even dogs assailed their masters, all save one, and he was faithful to a course, and kept the birds and beasts and famished men at bay. 
till hunger clung them, or the dropping dead lured their lank jaws, himself sought out no food, but with a piteous and perpetual moan and a quick desolate cry, licking the hand which answered not with a caress, he died. The crowd was famished by degrees, but two of an enormous city did survive, and they were enemies. They met beside the dying embers of an altar place, where had been heaped up a mass of holy things for an unholy usage. They raked up, and shivering scraped with their cold skeleton hands the feeble ashes and their feeble breath, blew for a little life and made a flame, which was a mockery. Then they lifted up their eyes as it grew lighter and beheld each other's aspects, saw and shrieked and died. Even of their mutual hideousness they died, unknowing who he was upon whose brow. Famine had written fiend, the world was void, the populace and the powerful was a lump, seasonless, herbless, treeless, manless, lifeless, a lump of death, a chaos of hard clay. The rivers, lakes, and ocean all stood still, and nothing stirred within their silent depths. Ships sailorless lay rotting on the sea, and their masts fell down piecemeal. As they dropped, they slept on the abyss without a surge. The waves were dead. The tides were in their grave. The moon, their mistress, had expired before. The winds were withered in the stagnant air, and the clouds perished. Darkness had no need of aid from them. She was the universe.